experts say Nigeria has the highest cases of sickle cell anemia in the world, with hundreds of thousands of births every year and only 5% of children living up to 10 years of age. On the other hand, in the UK and in the US, more than 96% of children living with sickle cell reportedly make it into adulthood. Tonight on Moments, we look at how we deal with sickle cell disease in Nigeria. Finally. Nice to see you, as always. Girl, I'm so happy that we're talking about this. Definitely, um, most definitely. You most know, definitely. I come from a family where I have a lot of cousins that are living with sickle cell, they're mm -hmm. SS. And it's been interesting because I think being part of their lives and also seeing, you know, the struggle and seeing them go through crises and also, you know, the stigmatization, yes. you know, I, I don't know what it feels like, but, you know, I've heard a lot of their stories and I can, I understand that there's a lot of discrimination and it's interesting because, you know, it's something that you never see as a disease. But one of my cousins says, you know, it, it's, it's for me, it's been a disability, specifically mm. now that he's at a stage in his life where he wants to get married mm. and, you know, the family of the girl that he wants to get married to, there's, there's hesitance, mm. you know, and the family's not supportive. Mm -hmm. And I found it interesting because I can understand that from a parent's side, but I think we just have to be, it's, a, it's about lack of education mm. and it's about fear, you know, and we've done really, really well relatively as a society. We're doing better in the fact that we're beginning to, you know, ask couples before they get married, yes. make sure that you get tested. At That's least know, very common because it's about knowing. And there mm. was even a time where I think at one point, doctor, um, some churches would not marry couples if they were both AS. I heard AS. about that. Yes, um, I heard about that. But I think for me, it's just about getting to a place where people who are living with sickle cell can feel like they have options yes, and also yes. feel like they have access to good medical health care as well. Most definitely, most definitely. I mean, I feel sickle cell, sometimes it's a bit of a, people feel they have to keep it a secret. I have friends who have sickle cell and they really don't like people to know. So unless you're very close to them, I mean, on the one hand, they feel people will treat them differently, but it's also, you know, there is a stigma about yeah. it. And, you know, people just think, oh, they can't do certain jobs or things like that. So I think, you know, we really have to uh, reorient our mindsets about it to realize, yes, you know, it, it is a, a disease, but, you know, there are, you know, palliative care mm -hmm. options to make people who have it, you know, still still continue to have a decent quality of life. Well, after the break, we'll be meeting our first guest, Emiene Adoga. She is a sickle cell disease carrier, and she joins us in a moment. Welcome back to Moments Nigeria. Today on the show, we're talking about people who are living with a sickle cell disease. And our first guest is Emiene Adoga, and she is SS. Hi, Aminia. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Thank to the you show. for coming on Moments Thank and you so for much being for so me. open <laughs> and sharing your story with us. So, can you just tell That's us, fine. you know, a little bit about your childhood and growing up with the disease? Uh, just last week, my mom reminded me of how she didn't even know anything about uh, genotype mm. or checking genotype and all of that, and that um, I didn't start falling sick until I was four years old. You know, and I asked her, how is that even possible that you didn't know my genotype? She said, ah, you know that time, uh, we didn't really used to check genotype. People would just say that children die in the villages and in towns, and um, people hardly knew why, you know. Mm -hmm. Then I was four, we kept going to different hospitals. Then a doctor, you know, a pediatrician said, you know what, we should check the genotype. And they're like, oh, SS, what's that? So before it was just AA and AS, you know, wow. my dad didn't know, my mm -hmm. mom. People around mm -hmm. just didn't know, you know, mm -hmm. so... She stressed the fact that um, it was just of recent, you know, we're talking about just, you know, maybe five, ten years back, but mm. enlightenment got better. And, and growing up, growing up was quite difficult. Even when I had to go to a boarding school, I still had professional treatment. It was annoying, you know. Sometimes some people will think uh, they envy me. They oh, I like the fact that you don't have to bath with cold water. Well, no, I want to bath with cold water. I just mm. want to be normal. Mm. But that's the thing about being SS. You're not normal. So you have to appreciate your kind of person. You have to appreciate... Uh, that different level you have naturally found yourself. So yeah, mm. growing up was quite difficult. Mm. Mm. That's mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. yeah, and in terms of, you know, you, you said you couldn't stress yourself too much you know, growing up just in case, you know, you went into crisis. Yeah. You know, the times when um, you did go into crisis, can you describe how that was? And in terms of even regaining your strength afterwards, what was, the ex what was that experience? Oh, well, I'm glad I can smile about this question <laughs> because uh, the crisis, crisis, uh, on a regular level, we could just call it pain episodes, you know, 
Now, this pain I'm talking about, it can't be described, it can't be weighed, it can't even, be, it can't be explained, it can't be shared either, you know. It's two kinds of pain. The inner pain you feel, you know, the uh, physical pain of your joints hurting, your head hurting, your whole body breaking down, and it's the pain of having family watch you go through that sort of pain. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of times I want to act very strong and not let anyone know I'm sick. But it doesn't go on for too long. My mom is like, you're not working well. <laughs> What's wrong with you? Mm -hmm. Then at that moment, I just break down. You know, it's, it's, it's not a beautiful thing to have family and friends watch you hurt, you know, for a couple of days. You're helpless. You can't deal with the pain. You can't even act like you're not in pain. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, having crisis and pain episodes, it was, it, was, it was terrible. And it still is. You know, there's... there's there's um, a belief that at a certain age, when people are 10, when you're 15, they outgrow it. No, we do not outgrow being sicklers or being, as they'll call it in the modern day term, being warriors. You know, what happens while you grow up is that you realize you, you, you manage yourself properly. Mm. You know, you learn better care. You don't just do some things that you want to do when you're much younger behind your mom's back and she comes back and finds out and you fall sick. So, mm. yeah, having crisis is, is, is usually the peak you know, of, of, of being assessed, but it's, it's, it's a whole lot. It's a whole lot. How, what are the triggers for crisis? Like uh, specifically now as an adult, because yeah. you mentioned managing yourself, mm -hmm. you know, so what are the things that still trigger a crisis? Uh, stress, me personally, mm -hmm. stress. You know, my doctor keeps telling me on how growing up, I always uh, got canceled. You know, you can't do a regular eight to five job, right? Mm -hmm. Like. I can't sit for too long, I can't stand, for, I stress basically, I can't drive the long distance. Uh, the weather, weather is, is, is an element as well. Too cold is a problem, too hot is a problem. We have routine drugs, okay. you always have to take your drugs, like you live your life basically taking drugs every day. Mm. At times I get tired of it, and you know what, I'm like, I feel good today, I don't have to take my yeah. drugs, but then again I go out and I come back and you see, you know, see so, side uh, effects. All right, I mean, and we're going to go on a quick break, but I want to talk a little bit more about, you know, the relationships you have with friends <laughs> and also employers yeah. and, you know, boyfriends. You know, what has that been like for you and how have they been receptive to the fact that you're SS? The conversation continues after this break. Welcome back to Moments Nigeria. Our topic today is dealing with sickle cell and we're with Emiene Adoga, who is, who has sickle cell, your yeah. SS. So before the break, you know, you were talking to us about, well, Bolani asked about your lifestyle mm -hmm. in terms of hanging out with friends, you mm -hmm. know, work. Have you been able to adapt your lifestyle to suit your condition so you don't miss out, you know, on things that a young woman your age would love to, to be doing? Uh, starting from work. You know, we're in a society where everyone will just jump at any job they find. But no, that's not the case for me. I'm quite picky. Not because I want to be, but because um, of the longevity of the job. I just might not be able to pull through a month or two. Mm -hmm. And I'll have to explain myself every day. I'm sorry I can't come to work today, mm -hmm. you know. And just to avoid that, uh, I settled for... Well, let me not say I settled. <laughs> I, I so your job is quite glamorous, <laughs> actually. Yeah, yeah so uh, I was lucky to get a, a job that I was comfortable with. And yeah, uh, it's quite uh, flexible, I must say. So yeah, it makes my, uh, my work lifestyle easy to deal with. Then with friends, you know, I always used to tell my friends, I'm not shady, I'm sick. If we're supposed to meet by 6 p.m. and just have a lovely evening, at times I just call and say, you know what, I cannot make it. And it's, it's, it's pissed them off a couple of times. But for new friends, it's harder because they just feel I'm being shady. And trust me, I really do want to hang out. But mm -hmm. it's probably too cold out there or I probably do have a headache. And if I stress myself, it will just, you know, get yeah. into. From there, you just take me to the hospital. Yeah. I've had a few times I have to drive myself to the hospital report sick. Wow. It's so bad at the hospital. Oh, you're here again. Oh, well, a nurse told me welcome one time, and, and I was wondering, you know. So, yeah, lifestyle with friends, it's, it's, they're always very careful with me. I do not like, just, you know, treat me normal until I prove mm. to you that I'm not strong enough. But, well, professional treatment sometimes, you know, but then mm. again, it's, it's, I've been able to handle it well. Okay, and I yeah. know that you have a baby, two, yeah, months, two years old. Two years old, yeah. So, you know, when you first found out you were pregnant, were you nervous and apprehensive about that? Yes, I was. Fear of the unknown. Okay. Mm. I didn't know how it would come out. I didn't know, you know, for a regular woman, you know the symptoms, you know what's going to happen. But me being irregular in a beautiful way, I must say, <laughs> I didn't know what to expect. 
you know, I spoke to my mom about it. Um, she didn't know what to expect as well. Come on, mm. she's, she's, she's not a psychic. But mm. over time, it was, it, was, it was difficult. It's okay for me to be in a hospital alone. But it, it was hard because I had someone with mm. me. I had someone I had to carry, you know, mm. to take care of. So I had to take care of two people and try to stay healthy for two people I was on oxygen now and then. You know, being pregnant, it was, it was, it was. Well, so you had a hard pregnancy? It, it was, yeah, okay. it, it was difficult. So it did was, you have to be on bed rest? Um, what special precautions did you I have to take? I was just always at home, home antenatal, home antenatal. Okay. I gave birth to him and uh, it was even harder after I gave birth to him. I was in hospital for two weeks. Wow. We, I'll have women come put to bed the next day, they're out. And I used to be so uncomfortable with the idea, you know. I became in, uh, like the owner of the bed space and the mm -hmm. owner of the room. Because women would come, I had, we had, I had several women come and give birth on it the next day. My son had to be transfused because, you know, I do not have enough blood for two people. So mm. obviously, he had to be transfused, you know. But we left after two weeks and he's, he's good. He's AS. Okay. He's AS and he's been really well. That's amazing. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I mean, in terms of, you know, dealing with the stigma, though, let's yeah. talk a little bit about that. And you mentioned that you have a good job where, mm -hmm. you know, you're comfortable. Does your employer know about your condition? Yes, they do. Okay. They have to know because okay. there's sometimes, no matter how flexible it is, there are sometimes I still call in sick. So uh, I, just, I just had a surgery, you know, and if, 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 if I didn't inform them from my first day of work, no matter how I would explain it, it would still come as I was yeah. a bit shady, you know. So I had a hospital write an official uh, letter to them describing the ailment and all of that. So yeah, it's... Yeah. it's, it's and it's, let's talk about the surgery. You mentioned it's a hip replacement. So can you explain why you had to have it and how common it is for, patient, for people who have SS to actually have those kind of surgeries? Uh, of recent, a good percentage of sickle cell patients, you know, uh, have issues with their joints that's okay. due to the little or no blood supply you know having the having our cells being anemic okay has very little oxygen yeah so uh, our joints being fixed yeah you tend to have little or no blood supply so it's it, um degenerates your bones mm -hmm. and the only option that there's no real there is no way to stop it if you do not uh, realize that at an early stage there are drugs like out of like, there are five stages of, of, of this you know it's called a vascular necrosis okay. usually uh, on the joints yeah and I had my, my ball right here and uh, I had a total hip replacement surgery in late term my ball and socket was replaced with metal wow. so yeah some friends of mine they keep calling me a cyborg and I'm fine with that you're like a female <laughs> river cop now you know you're, and you're uh, yeah a good percentage of sickle cell patients they do have this but when they start feeling the pain they just think it's a regular crisis okay. and that's where awareness comes in we need to know you know it's not just about the general public knowing about the genotype and what sickle cell is about it's about the sickle cell patients themselves no, no, no. knowing that when you feel pain sometimes it's not just a regular pain episode or crisis mm -hmm. it's something going on you know mm. so this year we've had a, a whole lot of cases you know talking about private and general hospitals mm -hmm. of cases of people coming for a, um, a vascular necrosis known as avn as well mm. you know having hip replacement if they knew on time if they didn't assume it was just a regular pain episode it would have been better so yeah that's just all about the surgery i had to do fantastic okay. fantastic mm -hmm. so i'd love to hear about you know any discrimination you feel you may have suffered as a result of being a sickle cell sufferer and of course about relationships mm -hmm. that'll be very very juicy that's coming up after this very short break after which we'll also be joined by by our second guest, who is a doctor, in fact, a hematologist. That's coming up. Welcome back to Moments Nigeria. Today on the show, we're talking about people who are living with a sickle cell disease. And our second guest is Dr. Mustafa Ulushegun. He's a senior registrar at the Department of Hematology, Lagos State University Teaching Hospital. Welcome to the show, doctor. Welcome. Um, we've been talking to a lot with MNA about her experience and you know just living with sickle cell but we want to get a little bit of the medical angle and the perspective now you're a hematologist so can you explain a little bit what that means and also how you've treated patients who are living with sickle cell um, thank you um, sickle cell disease is a disease that has to do with an abnormality of the formation of the hemoglobin that makes the blood okay and um, for an adult hemoglobin, there is an expectation, you know, in the formation process that comes normal. Now, when there is a defective in that formation process, that defect, uh, the, the, the defect could be that you're supposed to have a certain kind of amino acid making up the normal type of hemoglobin, which is the glutamic acid, then you now have a replacement of it, a substitution of it, 
by another amino acid, which is valine. Now, when that happens, there is a defective formation of the red cell. And so, in a situation where you're supposed to have like a well-rounded shape of the red blood cell that will flow much easily within the bloodstream, within the blood vessel, then you have them in a sickle shape. And then because they are sickle, you know, in their shape, anything that causes there to be um, a deoxygenation of it, then it becomes much more, more of it will be more sickle, and then the flow within the blood vessel is not as it ought to be, and then you can have a clogging up and all that, and then you have all the attendant issues, okay. you know, that goes with that. Okay. And, you know, in terms of lifestyle, you know, what are the really simple things anyone, you know, who's suffering from sickle cell can do just to ensure that they have, you know, the most stress-free lifestyle possible and, you know, just to avoid crisis? Um, well, to avoid crisis, we always, you know, talk to the patient when they come to the clinic because we have to do a lot of talking to the patient that, um, they have to keep themself, themselves warm. Mm -hmm. okay. They wear clothing that keeps them warm. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't have to expose themselves. We tell them not to engage themselves in strenuous work. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes we support them by writing letters or, you know, some other things to it's probably corporate. employers and mm -hmm. all that to tell them that this person shouldn't be engaged in so much strenuous activities. Okay. We advise people who are young like people who are teenagers who are like, say, boys, you don't go playing, you know, football to an extent that you get exhausted and all that. So anything that would, you know, cause them to be exhausted, you know, in terms of activities, anything that will cause them to be exposed to extreme of weather, and, um, you know, we tell them to avoid things like that. And um, we're also very careful, you know, how we... In terms of you how know, you relate. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, um, stem cell and also bone marrow transplant. Now, it's said that these two things can cure sickle cell. How true is that? And um, is it something that you've ever considered as well? Um, sure, yes. Um, the, the stem cell transplant mm. actually can, can um, you know, change the situation, all right? And um, these are things that are well documented. And as a matter of fact, interestingly, we have um, a hematologist who is based in Benin, Dr. Nosabazwaye, who is incidentally one of our trainers, mm -hmm. you know, that has been able to successfully, you know, do a stem cell transplant on sickle cell patient. I think about two or three of them right here in Nigeria okay. at the University of Benin Teaching Hospital. So it's an option which is actually a definitive kind of treatment, you know, for people who come down with um, that condition. So why isn't it more explored and why, is it, why isn't it more talked about? Because I know in France recently a doctor, you know, was able to cure a sickle cell patient. Mm -hmm you know, through doing a stem cell transplant. So um, do you think it, it'll ever get to a stage where this is a routine procedure that can be performed on patients with sickle cell? Um, well, yes, to answer your question straight, it's um, an option that would be better for people who already are um, having the sickle cell disease. But generally in medicine, you know, we've always advocated that prevention is better than, you know, looking for cure. Mm -hmm. And so if we can talk people out of a condition that will cause them to have children that will be sickle cell ultimately, why do we have to wait till they come down and then we're doing a stem cell transplant? But for people who already have the sickle cell disease, then it's something that can be done. I mean, is it a procedure you've ever considered? Yes, while growing up, you know, my dad used to always talking about having a bone marrow transplant. Mm -hmm. But uh, starting the procedure, he got scared, you know, he didn't want to do it. Uh, a few delays, you know, I got to school, I got to uni and we forgot about it. But talking of today, would I want to have a bone marrow transplant? I will say no, because okay. I'm done. Uh, it's difficult to say I now enjoy the skin I wear, the skin I'm under, you know, I, 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 I have plans of aggressively advocating for sickle cell anemia for those you know little kids who cannot afford and have people come through for them and also keep talking about it like you said you know happy having to stop the sickle circle you know that's the, that's a campaign that has been going on for some time you know a few sickle cell uh, NGOs you know organizations who have come out to say we need to stop the sickle circle you know so yeah I think I want to enjoy being right now I'm at a phase where I enjoy it 
you know, because I need to be there for those who cannot speak. And I can't speak for them if I am not one of them. So no, I do not want to have a bone marrow transplant. Okay. It will come out weird for my mom, she sees, if she okay. hears this. I do not want to because, um, like I said, managing. I've, I've, I've learned how to manage it so, mo so well, you know, hopefully. But for those who can afford it, for those who are not as careful as I am, for those who will have higher risk of, yeah. of, of being SS, you know, it's, 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 it's a good one for them. I've seen people in the US, you know, uh, being uh, cured. At the end of the day, you see cured from sickle cell anemia. So yes, every time I hear someone say, oh, I'm sorry, I hope there's a cure. I'm like, it's okay if you don't know, but hey, yeah, there is, it, is a it, cure. It, it might not come out the terminology of, of, of saying a cure per se, but yeah, that's what it is, you know? So yeah, having a full bone marrow transplant is what I hear more than the um, stem cell. So, okay. You know, having a full bone marrow transplant. And the next thing, they're really good. They still have the sickle cell physique, you know, there are certain features, physical features, sickle cell patients have. Mm -hmm. They still sort of have it, but then again, their blood cells are awesome. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much, Doctor, and thank you, m for coming on and speaking so candidly mm -hmm. and so honestly about your experience. Welcome back to Moments Nigeria. Now, in a nutshell, I think I'm really, really glad that we were able to speak to um, Dr. Lucia Guan m because I've noticed that there's been a huge movement of advocating for people who are living with sickle cell disease. Mm -hmm. You know, this year's um, sickle cell awareness day i felt like there was a lot of people talking about it and Definitely. we've always kind of had it in as a hush hush in our society yes. but it's very important that we talk about it so we can stop having the cycle reoccur i agree yeah. i agree i mean for me in a nutshell i think you know we've come to a stage now where sickle cell is not like a life sentence a death sentence you know it's something people are living with it very successfully of course there's lifestyle changes mm -hmm. they have to you know put into place but once those are put into place it's possible to live a very long very fruitful very happy life yeah. and with the advances yeah. in you know stem cell research and mm -hmm. the transplants mm -hmm. you know it's good to see that you know things very soon it might be common to have these stem cell transplants and things you know are changing so definitely yeah i'm happy that we most about definitely it. well thank you so much for joining us on another episode of moments nigeria we hope that you have been educated and enlightened also and we do hope that um we get to a place in nigeria where people who are living with sickle cell do not face discrimination and they also have viable and easy access to good healthcare systems. Thank you again for joining us and always remember if you can think it, you can do it.